my fellow Americans, tonight I am speaking to you because there is a growing humanitarian and security crisis at our southern border. Every week, 300 of our citizens are killed by heroin alone, 90 percent of which floods across from our southern border. This is a humanitarian crisis, a crisis of the heart and a crisis of the soul. How much more American blood must we shed before Congress does its job? Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jenna Flanagan. Last night, President Donald Trump addressed the nation and held firm stating his case for a wall along our southern border and the costs associated with it. Even if it comes with the cost of our government shut down until funding is found. In response, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi held a rare joint press conference immediately after, their stance resolute. Sadly, much of what we heard from President Trump throughout this sense of shutdown has been full of misinformation and even malice. The president has chosen fear. President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis, and must reopen the government. The symbol of America should be the Statue of Liberty, not a 30-foot wall. In the midst of the shutdown, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein announced early this morning that he is going to be the next to leave the administration. At stake, the Mueller probe and the investigation into interference into our 2016 election by Russia. And here in New York, the mayor unveiled a bold health plan ahead of the State of the City address. There's a lot to unpack today, both nationally and locally. And joining us now with analysis is former New York State Lieutenant Governor, New York Post columnist, and best-selling author of Beating Obamacare, Dr. Betsy McCoy, and New York Times best-selling author and award-winning columnist, Ellis Hennigan. Welcome to you both. Let's start first in Washington, and I want to get just reactions from both of you. Trump made a very strong moral argument for building the wall. Else. What a waste of time. Can I have my eight minutes back, please? <laughs> All right. And I think that is actually a perfect description of how America seems to feel. But of some of the points that the president was making, I mean, we didn't hear him in the traditional wall stance that he's taken, where he's hammered, like, we need a wall, we need to build a wall. He seemed to back off from that a little bit more. What did you think of the tone of his address? I thought it was compassionate and inclusive. And when I mentioned that he made the moral case, mm -hmm. he, he's been accused so often of asking for an immoral wall. And what he really said was it's immoral not to build the wall. It's immoral to allow some 500,000 very impoverished people to flood across the border and expect American taxpayers to pay for their food, their housing, their clothing, their medical care. Americans already maxed out helping the people who are already here. For example, in New York, 63,000 homeless, up 43% over 10 years. We need to take care of our own first. All right, and then Ellis? Yeah, 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 right. That's a great argument for a comprehensive immigration reform. What it's not an argument for is a wall. The last thing we need. First of all, what we got last night, right, was essentially the same warmed over arguments as the president has now been making for more than two years. And Americans aren't convinced by it. He can't get it through the, the, the Congress. He wasn't able to get it through the Congress when his party controlled both houses of it. I got to tell you, I think the networks got taken last night. I think all of us are, 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 are sucked into something that really should be held for an important national event. This was a fraud. Let me point out that, in fact, there is strong public support and support in Congress. Funding for the wall was passed in 2006, in 2013, and 18 months ago. Let's let's deal with the things that we know will work. Let's let's ignore the things that don't. Let's put it in the hands of actual experts, not base it on some slogan some guy was screaming out on the campaign trail to a bunch of yahoos who learned to answer it okay, back. Well, that is not the that, answer okay. to immigration okay. reform. I, not, I but think at the same Ellison, time, I should debate whether a wall works because at the beginning Europeans said a wall was not necessary. Mm -hmm. And then, because of the flood of migrants from the Middle East and from North Africa, they've realized that in this era of migration, walls are necessary. So, for example, the United Kingdom built a wall in Calais, France, to prevent migrants from jumping through into the channel and, and hopping on uh, trucks and, 
and cars going to Great Britain through the channel. Okay, but I mean, Spain again, like, wall. there is Europe and there is America. I mean, America is supposed to be a nation of immigrants, so right. people are going to immediately Legal push immigrants. back and say that's not necessarily... Legal immigrants. Yeah, okay. You and the president have tried to make that argument for many years now. It's failed. I mean, couldn't get it through Congress, still can't get it through Congress. Why we need to shut down the uh, an important part of the federal government in order to hold us hostage so the president can, can try and achieve in a unilateral way, I'm surprised this conservative you approve of that, but to do in a unilateral way, which simply our politics in America will not allow. No, but let's no. face it, without a wall, we don't have a border. And I'm you not talking necessarily about a concrete wall. The president has actually... The president did walk and wants. say that he that's wanted slats. slats. Yeah. Many experts say that's better because then the border guards can see through the slats and anticipate a problem. But without some sort of barrier, it's impossible to police a border that is as long as the distance from New York to Denver. It's a very long space. We have some sort of border on about a third of this space, well, I mean, but in two-thirds of the space, migrants are being brought across. So many of them are dying. You know, 500,000 last year came across illegally. 30% of the women faced some sort of sexual assault. 11,000 children arrived unaccompanied. This is a humanitarian crisis, and building some sort of a border will prevent those coyotes from exploiting these people often to their death. Well, I think everybody can agree that there definitely is a humanitarian crisis. Oh. The question then becomes what becomes of these people who are attempting to, a lot of them are trying to claim asylum when they get to the Only border. Only 8% qualify, and, and what unfortunately, we know. because asylum is for people who have been persecuted by their government. And most of these people are seeking economic benefits. They want to come to a country where they can get a job. That's understandable, but think about this. Other people are doing it legally. I also have a lot of heart for the people who are waiting in line, obeying the law, hoping to get to America and make a better life. They're doing it the right way, and why should these people be able to jump in front of them? You see, here's the problem. Not one of these things, some are legitimate, some are exaggerated that you describe, but not one of them will be solved by a wall. First of all, we understand that all these are families that we're worried about coming up from Central America. The vast majority of them are seeking asylum, a legal process that requires them to go to a legal port of entry and to present themselves, right? That's, that's what that's Most all about. Don't. I understand. The drugs that, that, that you and the president are so concerned about, the vast majority of them come up on trucks and in airplanes and in other ways that have nothing to do do with the 2,000 mile border. The, the largest group of people who are here illegally in this country come on legal visas, right? And then they overstay those visas. You could we build that wall, ask. Betsy, a thousand feet in the sky. It's not going to do one thing. You know this what? is a campaign you know, slogan. Is this, is not this is not policy. If you had a problem like policy. auto accidents, mm -hmm. you wouldn't say, well, don't worry about auto accidents. No. More people die Let's, of cancer. No. We can solve both those problems. We can okay. solve the visa overstayers and the people but who right now we are talking about the president's right. proposition right. of the wall. However, yes. he wasn't the only person who spoke last night, and I do want to address the Democratic response. Mm -hmm. What did you guys think? I think it's unfair for the Democrats to label the wall immoral or racist. They can have a disagreement on policy. I respect that. That's our system. But to use those ugly, unfair words is why there's no compromise. Once you call somebody immoral or a racist, how can you compromise with them? It's not racist that the border wall that's being asked for is on the southern border. If you look at the Canadian border, only 349 people came across that border illegally last year. So when Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut says it's racist to want a border wall on the south and not the north, the border wall is needed on the southern border because that's where the lawbreakers are. 500,000 people compared with 349. Well, Alice? you know, Betsy may not be motivated by racist feelings, but let me tell you, this was used in a racist way by the president. Many people are responding to it in ways that are racist. Then we really have to get back to the actual practicalities of what we're doing here, right? Yes, there's an issue with the border. Yes, we need to deal with it. But there is no argument for shutting down the government, holding all of us hostage while we have these debates, right? Harming all kinds of innocent people in important parts of this country, right? And we are taking the decision away 
from the people who actually, you know, there are some parts in the border where we may need a fence. We've got 600 miles of it already. But the notion of this, this sea, the shining sea of, of, of huge walls, I don't even think the president believes that anymore. In fact, he okay. seems to be back I in the I would love to keep going. I would love to keep going on this one, but unfortunately we do have to move on because so much news is happening. Yes. Sure, there is and a lot. From uh, the president's address and the Democratic response, I would like to move on to the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein. Ouch. You know what? He has been a, a sterling professional. Now, a appointed by a Republican president, as you know. So and I, I know a lot of my Republican friends loved him when he first came around. But he has truly been a bulwark when we have needed it most, protecting the Mueller investigation, going by the rule of law, not allowing himself to be brought into these, uh, these, uh, these political hit jobs that we're seeing. It makes me nervous that he's leaving. I got to tell you the truth. I'm not nervous because he said the day he took the job that he was only staying two years. So he's leaving on schedule. He's leaving of his own volition. The president did not ask him to leave. And we have a new attorney general coming in, mm. and it's customary that the new attorney general will build his own team. So there are no red flags here with Rod leaving. All right. Well, then moving on to, uh, as you were saying, the investigation that Rod has played a hand in protecting, as some people are saying, the Mueller investigation. We've seen a lot of uh, headlines around that. What are your responses to the latest developments with this? And we still haven't gotten a report yet. You know, it's amazing to me that after all this time, he has not connected the dots. He's issued quite a few indictments, which I've read carefully against Russians, Russian companies, and Russian individuals. And quite separately, he's gone after people like Paul Manafort for acts they committed long before they worked for Trump. But he hasn't been able to link any of these misdeeds to the White House to the president or to the president's presidential campaign. That's We haven't seen that yet. Well, you know, let me remind you of the fact that just came out yesterday. It's so interesting. The, the chairman of the president's campaign, Mr. Manafort, we've just learned, was showing internal polling documents to someone who is intimately close to the Putin regime in, in the Kremlin. That ought to make all of us nervous. It, frankly, Why? it's one of a... Why? Because they're coordinating with the Russians in the middle of the election and showing them. I don't see if any that doesn't, of that yet. well, it's it's in you know, literally, Betsy. It's, it's it's in the court papers that came out yesterday. The series of indictments we've had, the guilty pleas and the cooperatives. Many no, of the people pleas. very closest to everybody the, pleads guilty in our system. Unfortunately, now the right to a, a trial by jury is virtually vanished because what the prosecutor says, somebody like Mueller is, well, if you if you plead. Uh, guilty and cooperate, you'll only get a little prison time. But if you plead innocent and demand your constitutional right to trial by jury, we're going to give you a lifetime in prison. So even people who aren't guilty plead guilty to save their own necks. The president's and campaign, then they testify against somebody else. The president's hey, campaign Alice. manager, the deputy campaign manager, his private attorney, the list goes on They've and all on. Pleaded this never happened the in the Obama administration, to did it? The president. Never Unrelated happened. Unrelated to the president. Never right, happened well, the in the last one, did it? We are definitely still waiting for the report. <laughs> Everybody yeah. wants to well, see what's in this report. A whole report. other show on that one. Good stuff. But of course, Moving on to the local uh, front, yeah. we have Mayor de Blasio. He's going to be giving his State of the City address, and we've seen him roll out some new policy proposals. Yeah. His biggest one seems to be health care. Right, I know you have a lot to say oh, on health care, so... Both of us do, sure. <laughs> well, what do you think? This was a political hoax yesterday. He, uh, he made an announcement that in the city of New York, every single person will have access to publicly provided health care and their own doctor, right? And he said he was going to accomplish all of this for $100 million a year, where there are 600,000 uninsured people. That works out to $170 a year per person. You might be able to get an appointment with a nurse practitioner for that amount of money, provided you don't expect any follow-up tests or medications. I've got to stand up for nurse practitioners for a second. Do not diss them. They are I the didn't future, diss them. They are the it's just future that they of charge, healthcare. They charge less than a physician. They a physician the, would be $300. They are the future of primary health care yep. in this country. Listen, mm -hmm. there's a big problem, right? In a decent society, and I know you join me in this, people have a right to health care, right? They should not have sicknesses and illnesses and problems and be un able because of economic reasons to get decent basic health care. Listen, it's complicated. It's expensive. All kind of public interests and private interests are fighting about it. But you know what? I got to give the mayor a little bit of credit to stand up and say, look, this is important. This is a compassionate city. We got a lot of money here. And you know what? 
Let's try to take a Wait a second. This. this was a mirage. This is a highly ambitious mayor who would like to be out in the field with the presidential wannabes with Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren. He wants to be up on that stage. Universal health care is a major issue. So we held a press conference. But there's no meat behind it. There are no changes. He can't take a million, a hundred million dollars and ensure that 600,000 people will have a primary care physician, which is what he promised yesterday. It's not happening. It's a hoax. Yeah, maybe we can get there some of that wall questions. money we've been hearing yeah. about. Maybe some of that will help. Huh? That, you know, we, I was seeing coming out of the press right. after his announcement. Um, exactly how is all of this going to be paid for? It's, listen, it's complicated and it is expensive. That's not and because, a good of, answer. because of the <laughs> insurance companies and the profit motive and some of the bureaucracy and the history of this, it is very challenging. In this country, we spend more than anyone on earth and we get worse results no, than many, true. many developed countries. And we have, as you know, millions and millions of Americans who do not receive adequate health care, who don't have health insurance, who can't afford it. It's a burden even for middle class people today. Uh, listen, I want our politicians solving that. Join me on Medicare for all. Let's get uh, some okay, real health care out there. Let me ask one question because we yes. know that the mayors always go up to Albany for their um, tin cup day, if yes. you will. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if this is a ploy to perhaps push Albany because they're going to be looking Part at health care. I don't think state. Andrew Cuomo will do that. He has his own eyes on the White House in 2020. He knows that his lane is going to be the moderate lane. And these universal health care proposals all require that the 160 million people who get health care on the job, many of them in public unions, give up their health care and become part of this public system. And it's never going to fly. So the fact is Andrew Cuomo is too sensible to get behind that. You know, I've been here for a long time from my conservative friends, how we can't do it, it's too complicated, it's too expensive, Americans really don't have the right, just let them be sick or show up at the emergency room. I don't believe any of it. Other countries are able to do it way better than we do it. And you know what? Yeah. It's Yes, it's difficult. It's expensive. But, you know, why don't we start trying some stuff? And bro these are really our human rights. People shouldn't be sick and unable to go to a doctor. I am fully supportive of helping the uninsured, but I am not going to rip health coverage away from people who already have it and like it. And those 160, 165 million people who have earned on-the-job health care coverage should not be told they have to give it up. I could continue to talking to you for a long time, so I hope to have you both back for another debate on all of these issues. That's good. Good to, good to see you. Fair <laughs> enough. All right, Fair thank enough. you.